going to get started with the Global Math Department this evening. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Lena Taro and I'm going to be the host for tonight. Tonight we're gonna hear from Judy Larson about how thinking classrooms look and feel. And I think this is probably an ideal topic for starting off the beginning of, of the school year. Um, before I introduce Judy and have her give her presentation, I would like everyone to introduce themselves in the chat window, telling us what you teach, where you teach, and what your Twitter handle is, if you have one. Oh, hi, Norma, yay, came in. Oh, hey, Nathan. It's great that we have a lot of people from all over. Yeah, wow. New York, Boston, Ontario, Ontario. Canada, Omaha. Baltimore. Excellent. This is going to be an excellent session tonight. So before I introduce our speaker and turn the session over to her, let me explain a little bit about how these meetings work. These meetings are recorded and the chat also gets recorded and the recordings are available uh, within 24 hours after the meeting ends. To review the recording, you would come back to the same URL you used to get here. The global math community prides itself on being friendly and supportive. The chat room is available for topical and general conversations throughout the meeting. Uh, I'll catch your questions for the presenter, so don't worry that she won't notice it in the chatter. So our speaker tonight is Judy Larson. And I just lost Hi. your bio. Here we go. <laughs> Judy Larson is an associate professor at the University of Fraser Valley, where she teaches mathematics upgrading courses, as well as courses designed for prospective mathematics teachers. As a doctoral candidate in mathematics education at Simon Fraser University, she currently pursues research into the generative possibilities of community spaces related to mathematics education including those within social media settings. She's also deeply interested in environments that occasion math, excuse me, occasion mathematical thinking, the role of autonomy in mathematics classrooms, effective aspects of learning mathematics, and mathematics teacher professional learning. She actively participates in the online mathematics education community through Twitter at Judy Larson3 and hosts a website at judylarson.ca. So welcome, Judy. Hello and welcome. Thanks so much for tuning in on uh, some, of, some of you might have your first day of school today. So I understand how tired and uh, uh, how you may have had low amounts of sleep. So I'd like to thank Dylan Kane for inviting me uh, and Lee for hosting today as well. This is somewhat a follow-up session to Dr. Peter Liliadal's Building Thinking Classrooms Global Math webinar from back in March 2017. So if you haven't checked that out, uh, it's worth checking out. He spent over 15 years researching student engagement, the aha experience, mathematical thinking in hundreds of classrooms, and it's led him to develop a set of tools or conditions that we can use as teachers to transform our classrooms and our practices. His work has received numerous awards and more importantly, has impacted the lives of teachers and students around the world. Some of you um, who are actually here in the chat window today. Uh, here's another link to a short um, article that Peter wrote to outline some of these conditions as well. So if you haven't seen some of this, there is a lot to dig into. Um, but I'm excited to share some of my own insights as I've been privileged to have worked with Peter as a grad student and have visited many of the classrooms that use his findings, um, as well as implementing it in my own classroom. So in true Peter style, I'd like us to start with a bit of math. And some of you may have seen this, but this is one of my favorite 
tasks and the only one I could think of that might work with a chat pane format. So here's the number 25. It's one of my favorite, has a lot of nice properties, you know, perfect square and all that, but it can be decomposed. So for instance, 20 and five. It can also be decomposed in, in other ways, 10, 10 and five and some more. So what I'd like you to try here is to decompose 25 into however many uh, positive add-ins that you like. But I'd like to you to also give me the product. So let's try this out and see if you can uh, enter this into the chat pane. Yes, and Joey, thank you for the link. I'm going to attach that later. So if you could try your own decomposition and give a product. So we got one here from Vincent. And you may use a calculator, I'm not watching. Nice. Cool, we got 567, we got 80, we got 120, we have 2,500. So as we're doing this, I'd like you to challenge you a little bit and see if you can get higher than someone else in the chat pane. Can you make your product bigger? Ooh, I like the decimals. So the big question is, who can get the biggest product? I'll give you a few more moments here. Ooh, nice. 3,000. <laughs> Getting creative here. All right, we're getting some bigger numbers. So now take a moment and look back and see which ones are biggest and why do you think so? Nice, okay, so you've explored a little bit here. Uh, so this is actually a really, really cool problem and I encourage you to keep thinking about how to get a bigger product. Um, some, of, some of you have gotten a really, really big one. Here we got 6,000, but I assure you that there are ways to make it better. Um, and you can actually refer to this problem. It's from Play With Your Math. It's initially shared um, by Malcolm Swan, I believe, and Dan Meyer shared it, and Peter uses it all the time. And we got some reasoning here. So let's just pause and reflect at, for, the, for this moment right now and think back to your thoughts as we were trying to do that. So think back to your thoughts and think, what did you start doing in your head during this activity? What kind of thinking were you starting to do? All right, we got guess and check, repeated addition, playing with the factors, small and larger, at first random until Oh, the large target was mentioned. Comparing good versus bad answers. Thinking about what I know about maximizing area. That's really cool. Visualizing. Waiting to see what others wrote. That's great.
Okay, awesome. So we're doing a lot of thinking here, looking at others' work. Nice. So now I'd like you to stop there and think about if you gave your students this task, what would you want to see from them? What would you expect them to do? To engage, to give effort, to guess and check, keep trying. Smiles, that's awesome, thank you, Jimmy. Look for patterns, try to beat their previous answer, visualize the right amount of competition and challenge, guide them to start different add-ins and look for patterns. Cool, so we actually want our students to keep trying. That's the one thing that some of you kept doing is you kept trying. So what we want from our students is actually that they become problem solvers, collaborators, that they're resilient, engaged, and that they most importantly are thinkers. After all, the purpose of education is to teach thinking, not content. Now, of course, we want to, them to know content, but we don't want them to do content without thinking about it. That would be antithetical to our aims as teachers as teachers who want to help um, form engaged and informed citizens. So no matter what, um, sorry, but sometimes no matter what we try, and I've been in this situation as a, as a teacher, we're faced with this, confusion, uh, boredom, disengagement, and sometimes even hidden forms of completing work legitimately in front of us without engaging meaningfully and thoughtfully. Now, this is not always the case, but somehow this somehow always happens. Why? Well, Peter's work is actually rooted in observing classrooms, hundreds of classrooms, looking at where is the thinking happening and who holds the power in the room. And as Peter observed, he noticed that uh, there was very little thinking in a lot of classrooms, but that there were practices that were common to all the classrooms. And these are actually guided by institutional norms. And what, what's meant by that is that you, the teacher, and them, the students, all play this um, game of school. And it's often uh, related to our past experiences as learners. But this has persisted for many years. It's, it's been like this for a long time. And our furniture, our default school arrangements often look like this. But sometimes even when we try something, we try to change the desk. So we try to change uh, our group work strategies. We're pulling at different pieces and we're not changing everything. So, so the system actually fights back and um, the habits that persist in a classroom um, continue. So Peter's work was really all about renegotiating those norms. And he spent over 15 years, as I mentioned, playing with and toying with each of these um, different factors that are part of our practice. So here are the dimensions of practice that Peter has played with in his research. Um, he's looked at how do we give problems? Uh, what kind of problems are we giving? How is the room organized? How are groups formed, etc.? A lot of these things we actually end up doing automatically. We um, don't even notice ourselves uh, falling into certain patterns and habits of what we do. And much of that is actually informed by the school space that we live in. So, Peter took a contrarian approach and started thinking, okay, well, if students write on paper, then what else could they write on? If the teacher's at the front, where else could the teacher be? If um, we're giving notes as a, a 
a primary method of knowledge um, transmission, how else could that happen? And so from this questioning and tinkering was born this idea of a thinking classroom, which is a classroom that's um, inhabited by thinking individuals, as well as individuals thinking, uh, learning together and constructing knowledge through activity and discussion. So some of you may have heard of a thinking classroom, some of you may not have, um, but you must have signed up to the session for some reason. So if you could maybe think of, a, let's start with what you know about thinking classrooms. So in the chat pane, if you think of like one thing you that thinking classrooms make you think of, um, put that in the chat pane. What do you know thinking classrooms to be? What do you associate with it? Okay, collaboration, flow, students working on boards, students doing more of the talking, visibly random grouping, defronting the room, engagement, VNPS, vertical surfaces, random groups. Hey, Laura. Taking risks. Cool. All right, so we got a lot of ideas here and you actually know a lot about this. And yeah, let's keep these coming for a little bit here. Cool, nice. So a lot of times, um, and on Twitter, VNPS is what stands out, uh, it's sort of the way that it made its way onto Twitter is people sharing uh, examples of kids working on boards. Uh, this is actually a snip from when I search VNPS on Twitter and I look at the photos option. This was what came up first, so this is quite recent. And you can also notice that kids are working in small groups, groups of three, and there's numbers. So Peter's research around this found that vertical non-permanent surfaces, which, you know, we could say whiteboards, but um, they're vertical and they're erasable. And some people use other materials other than whiteboards. He found that out of all of the different surfaces they tested, which included horizontal and vertical options, as well as a personal notebook, versus um, paper-based products, uh, that this combination allowed for quicker time to task, students feeling more comfortable to put down rough ideas, better participation, discussion, persistence, mobility of knowledge, all of these things that actually um, work to support collaboration. Another tool that is often really well known is visibly random groups. Um, and so some of you mentioned collaboration and um, those sorts of things. And visibly random groups really helps with that. Uh, Peter's research about visibly random groups actually was uh, conducted in a place that didn't use any of the other um, aspects of thinking classrooms. So um, it was in a class that didn't use whiteboards. Um, and it proved to, to show significant improvements in eliminating social barriers, improving mobility of knowledge, decreasing reliance on the teacher for answers, increasing reliance within the groups for answers, and improving engagement and enthusiasm for the class. So personally, for me, this has been an absolute game changer. Um, it's helped to build community in my room and making, making the class a safe space. Now, the cool thing about this is that every time I do an activity, I'll have a new randomized group setting. So the beauty of it happens because it's done frequently. So students don't think you're picking on them. And they also get to experience different roles in the group solving process. So you can be a master at something in one group, but then you may be learning from someone in another group. 
also, uh, students are more likely to know each other's names, to go over to another team teammate um, who may be from a different social setting or social class potentially. So this has been very empowering. And I found personally groups of two or three have been best. Three give enough diversity so that the students' ideas um, can flow. With two, sometimes it's a gamble. So, I mean, these are the, the big two that a lot of people know. Um, there are way more features that Peter has worked towards in, in terms of this cohesive whole. So giving good problems. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about good problems and what that means. It's, it's, it depends on uh, how much thinking is left in the problem. Giving them verbally so that it's engaging. Um, creating this culture of thinking, defronting the room, et cetera. Laura Wheeler actually created this really cool sketch note of all of Peter's work in one page. It's really cool. Uh, but it's a lot to take in. So we're going to focus a little bit more on um, the student level here. There's also a, a ton of research that you could consult um, if you wanted to read some of this stuff. But I want to look at a, a quote from Jimmy Pai. He says, it's more than just VNPS and VRG, which I just talked about. It's an evolving structure we adapt. And more importantly, um, we adapt it to the students in our spaces. So I found this to be really powerful because we're constantly adapting to who's in our classroom and what we need to do and what autonomy we need to take as teachers to make it work. Also, it's, it's really not meant to be a lesson starter. It's more of a culture builder. Um, so it works together. All the pieces come together and becomes a new normal, a new culture. So what I'd like to do right now is play you a video of a classroom. Let me just make that happen here. So hopefully you can see that. So this is Alex Overwick's classroom in Ottawa. And I'd like you to try to watch this and think of what you notice and what you may be surprised by. If you can't see the video, I just put a YouTube link in the chat pane. I'm going to replay this from the beginning so you can see it again, see if you notice anything new. <laughs> seemingly unprompted by the teacher. So where is the teacher anyway? Those of you who don't know Alex. We don't see the teacher. The super group formed. So Williams, uh, so this is a actually a slowed down um, zoomed in version right now that's playing. Do you see that kid that's actually writing some notes right now? Right, yes, Anne, thank you. <laughs> yes, we'd need to draw big circles around Al. So Al is actually um, directing this space, but in a very uh, interesting manner. So he has students uh, around the boards 
there's one person here in the center, the, the girl in the center. She's actually an observer from another country. And this is actually um, a group of students that is not in the top stream of academics. I believe they're grade 11s. Yes, no, the girl in the gray, gray sweater is not the teacher. The teacher is actually a tall man, which you can't see right now. So some of you uh, noted that there's this sort of super group that forms. What do you think is happening during the super group mo moment? Right, leveling. So what he's doing when he's leveling is it's kind of like a we, you can also call it a consolidation piece. Um, it's basically a moment at which you bring everyone together or you use the board work and you point out things that you know everyone can access. So it's a low floor sort of thing, um, but you're basically stringing all the pieces together of what you've, you've experienced in this space. Now, what's interesting is Al actually had them come form a super group and leveled right here. And then he gets them to break off again into, and the video cuts out, but he actually continues the lesson. So there's room to play. Okay, cool. So you've pointed out some things. The teacher is uh, kind of hidden. There is actually a cool little board in the corner on the very left-hand side. And the teacher's actually giving um, new problems up there that students are continuing on with. So I'm gonna play you another video and this one has sound. So I'd like you to listen uh, to the student conversation that you hear, it's very short. Um, so let's see if that'll play here. And see what you notice in here. That's Jamie the the people's class. Um, here, I'll play it again and see if that helps you uh, make any observations. Oh, sorry, Sarah. Um, Jamie's Jamie's video is right here. Hopefully that works. Okay, so let's see what um, you said here. So the vocabulary use is really interesting and I find this in my own classes as well. Lots of talking, uh, lots of um, rich conversation among students. So have you ever noticed that when you ask um, a student to explain something to you, they have a hard time telling you what they mean. But when they talk to their peer, there's something magical that happens and they're able to communicate. And so there's something to do with um, what's referred to as register of language. So uh, peers among peers, uh, they can speak to each other more easily because they share sort of the same level of language. Uh, whereas if a student is asked to present something in front of the whole group, including the teacher, they often stumble because they're trying to raise their level of language. So uh, you might have noticed that. Register, Matt. Register, think of like when your, your vocal register, low and high. <laughs> so there's a lot here there's a lot going on and and the thing is it can seem overwhelming at first um but but there are a lot of ways to uh, get started and to do simple things uh, so let me just get the presentation happening again 
one second. It went back. All right. So, but how? How does it look and feel on a daily basis? So, first of all, if you notice that Al's video was really quick, that's because that was an entire lesson put into like 60 seconds of video, which is um, very, very interesting that that was the whole class. And so, I'm just going to give you some tips on wh what happens as, as, um, as someone who's done this, but just because I mentioned, like you actually get through a lot of content very quickly, um, but I'll talk about that a bit later. So when students enter the room, what happens? So it, personally, I use playing cards. Uh, these are Owl Overwix cards. Um, a little less organized than, than I'd like, but uh, he's got cards and he gives them out. Um, and so what I do, as I say, when I enter the room, I say, okay, everyone gather around. I tell them a bit of a story about a problem or a task, or it might even be like, hey, look, we learned how to expand um, and now we're gonna learn how to factor. And then I distribute the cards um, and then essentially you're managing flow and putting in consolidation pieces as needed. But it's kind of an organic um, setup and it's really a way of life for me personally. Here's Al in mid uh, helping mode. There is a teacher in the room, you can see. And here's his little board on the right where he gives new problems to manage flow. And what managing flow really means is this um, balance between challenge and skill to keep students engaged. Um, and so quite often we actually give problems that are too easy um, and students get bored. And so I find when I plan, I actually have a list of incre increasing order in difficulty of problems in increasing order and in difficulty because then I can kind of gauge where they're at and I can adjust accordingly based on what students need. Yes, um, the board there is, is a really cool way of giving extensions and then students don't feel like they have to all move on at the same time. So there's a lot of differentiation. So entering the room, Laura Wheeler. Um, and one really cool thing I, I noticed was that Laura greeted every single student when she entered, when they entered the room. Um, so did Jamie and other teachers I've seen as well. It creates this really um, pleasant atmosphere. The other neat thing Laura has going on is she's got these really cool hanging numbers and uh, posted numbers as well. So uh, essentially you enter the room, the students get a card, they go to their seat. And then when she's given the introductory launch, they all gather around that board and continue on. And here is Mike Pruner's classroom. It looks quite different. He's got a digital randomizer over here um, on the top right, uh, where students also get uh, visibly random grouped. They also have their bags in a corner, which is kind of like makes the space a little more organized. So good problems. Let's let's tackle this one a little bit. What is a good problem? What makes something a good problem? Um, any guesses? Any any takes on this? Low floor, high ceiling has multiple approaches. Is thought provoking, authentic. Answer's not obvious. So Peter's answer to this is a problem that leaves students something to think about. And this is very vague, but essentially you can make a lot of different problems into good problems by, by making sure that there are enough degrees of freedom and that you haven't overtaught everything. Like you can teach factoring by taking um, a binomial and expanding it 
and then saying, giving another um, trinomial and saying, okay, how do you get back to uh, where we started? And so that's factoring in a nutshell. They can figure it out. So something that Jimmy and I talk a lot about and, and others as well, that it's really culture first. Once the culture is built, you can fly with so many options. Um, you can take textbook problems and, and, and spin them into great problems. But the culture comes first. So Will and I were having a conversation earlier this week and he mentioned he spent the first week developing culture and learning about good collaboration. And so sometimes you need to address some of these things at the beginning to set those norms. Um, so remember how at the beginning I talked about these institutional norms we have? those norms will uh, sort of evolve as you as you change the structures and if you change enough components of your classroom so the desks and the whiteboards and the writing surfaces and the type of problems it kind of shocks the system and so that helps build a new culture a culture of thinking so I see some of you are talking about the UCube database. Yes, definitely. Uh, there are a lot of different databases. So I have a couple of things linked here. Um, I will have a handout that I link at the very end um, that I'll share with you that has a few more links. Uh, you can check out Peter's site uh, under good problems and he's got a whole set of those. A lot of these are good to start with um, to really set these norms. Visual patterns, three act tasks, open middle, uh, skyscrapers, fraction talks. Um, I've seen a lot of talk about the four fours lately. Um, some people are complaining that everyone uses four fours. You could try it with other numbers like 2018 for 2018. And you can even take tasks that are full of writing and if you tell them verbally or or just write a few things down um, you're not overlaying too much text on the students and then it's easier for them to start working on it so giving it verbally uh, here's an example of uh, when I saw in Al's class, clearly I was there, <laughs> so I took lots of pictures. Um, he used Dan Meyer's Dandy Candies and uh, converted it into basically the story about um, candies and we using manipulatives. And kids, you know, would, the neat thing was because they had these manipulatives in the center of the classroom, they would come over and play with the manipulatives and then go back to their group and talk about it. So that was actually very, very cool to see. One of my favorite lessons was really filled with story. So um, Jamie took uh, Kyle Pierce's activity. Well, it's probably a past activity that's been passed down for ages, but from Kyle Pierce's site, he has a three act task with a video of a candle burning. And so Jamie basically came in and just started talking to the students about their weekends and asked them, um, you know, what they did this weekend, built relationships. And then eventually she said, well, I have some, I had some people come over and I'm wondering about my candles and how long they burn. So she kind of led into this story and then she actually made the students watch this candle burning. <laughs> and you can imagine that they were a little bit surprised. What's cool is that when the candle video ended, she said, you have data points all over the room, you have clues all over the room. And you can kind of see in this picture, students taking photos of these data points of the candle burning. And the data points didn't actually have any info about what they meant. So the students had a good conversation about units because of that. And then eventually they started creating these graphs um, and they had to talk about scale. They had a really rich discussion about scale, scatter plots, and this linear relationship that they discovered. And one of the big things I observed was students starting to explain things to each other. 
as well as um, later I learned that Jamie actually put this one data point that's really high up here so that a, when a particular student who had height um, but often didn't have much to contribute could contribute to the conversation. So eventually, once you build culture, you can literally take anything from a textbook and add some degrees of freedom, maybe remove something, maybe say a bit less about it, and they figure a lot of it out. So that's one thing that I've learned myself as a teacher is that I can use my textbook eventually and get through a lot of content because they know more than, than, than we think they do. Sometimes I also put things on slips of paper and hand them out to um, manage flow. This is an example of Al's slips of paper, these lovely um, logarithmic and or exponential functions. And so here's some student work. Um, this is actually from Jimmy Pye's class. So I'd like you to take a moment and let's do a little bit notice wonder here. So this is a trace. This is after all the activity happened, the students left the room and I see this on the board and I'm thinking, wow, what happened here? So maybe take a moment and type in the chat pane, share out what, what intrigues you about this, what surprises you, or what do you find interesting about this uh, student work here. <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> All right. Yeah, let's keep these coming. Yes, they're using because, very good. Okay, so some of the initial comments had to do with what a mess this is. So um, yes, this is very interesting. It often looks like, <laughs> a massacre or, or, in my classroom after, after a period of work. What's interesting is that this is actually a lot of writing for, for this sort of work. Um, so clearly Jimmy was trying to get them to explain things. Um, one thing I've done after this session to consolidate is I'll ask them to go back and annotate their work so that someone else could read it. So if I want to do a bit of a gallery walk, let's say they've finished all of these problems and, and you're consolidating, but you want them to come back to it and review what, what they actually did. So sometimes I'll say, go back to your group and make your, like annotate your work so that people can see what happened and then go around the room and see other people's work. And so that has actually helped a lot. I don't actually have a picture of that because I just thought of that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it actually worked really nicely. Also, if the purpose, you have to think of the purpose. If the purpose here was to, for them to be doing um, the activity, you could have them afterwards go back and say, take some meaningful notes. So there was this, I'm just looking through the chat pane. There was this question about, um, what came before this. So just for context, Jimmy actually started with this shape and, um, you know, it folds in together. 
and he had them noticing and wondering about the shape and from this came questions about volume and that's what they're talking about in terms of dividing. So as someone also asked about assessment and tests and everyone is um, a little bit different in this regard. Everyone has their own structure, uh, but everything I've heard of, of people doing in these situations has to do with valuing student thinking. So how does your assessment structure value student thinking? Um, and there are different ways of making sure that it is communicated to them that they know that what you care about is their reasoning and their thinking, not the answers. And so that comes in many different forms. Uh, we could do a full um, session on <laughs> assessment, but some people you can talk to, for instance, Al does uh, whiteboard tests. Uh, Ann Arden's got some really cool things. Um, Laura Wheeler, I believe you have some neat things. But most of all, I, I want to, I want you to keep in mind that it's not a free for all. A lot of people think, oh, thinking classrooms, kids on boards. And a lot of times what you see on Twitter is people posting pictures of students at the boards. Um, but what some of you have noticed is that there are moments of consolidation and these conversations that happen are really important. So there's this piece that often gets sort of ignored and that's consolidation and taking meaningful notes. And these moments are critical. So here's a kind of like a little bit of a sketch. I mean, this is give or take, but the bulk of the lesson in a thinking classroom is you managing flow and stoking the fire and getting kids thinking and questioning. But at some point there needs to be some sort of consolidation, whether it's a annotate your work or let's gather around this person's work or um, what just happened here, restating it. And usually it's best for the teacher to actually restate it at this point so that you know that everyone can access that. Taking meaningful notes, uh, for instance, uh, can look, oh, here's the consolidation picture. Actually, here's another way of consolidating. Um, it, it, taking using one note to gather student photos and then bringing it together. Um, oh yeah, and Laura's got this cool Pear Deck thing she does to ask them, what did we actually do today? And back to meaningful notes, here's an example from Jamie. She's got these cool little um, slips of paper that she keeps handy. And then the students get them at, the, at, at a certain point uh, when they're ready to add to their special sheet. And they create these notes based on what they've done. But there's also uh, like uh, note packages. I mean, we're all familiar with these, but a lot is missing in these note packages. So this is Laura's. She's got a five page, is it five pages? I think it's about five pages. And it's the entire course in that pack. So students can keep coming back to this as they learn things and adding to what they know. And then also, of course, there's an important moment where you say, okay, here's a, two problems, like try them out however you like and check your understanding. So those moments are important. But what's really cool about the flow piece is that students end up sticking around. They just don't leave. I've had classes where like the next instructor wants to get into my room and people are still doing math and you know they're not trying to leave um, and they have full right to. This is um, Tom's class during lunch and there's actually people, kids teaching each other factoring during lunch. Amazing, I know. So some things I've observed personally in my time doing this, also attending a lot of Peter's workshops and looking at um, classrooms of many wonderful teachers, who, many of whom are here today. And to be honest, the network is, incredible so feel free to tap into that everyone's very giving i've observed a few things and this is one of many but they have to do with community the community piece affects behavior 
I've seen classes where you see the sort of um, the off task student starting to get off task and, and you see it because they're up at the boards, but all of a sudden they turn around and they're just staring blankly somewhere and all of a sudden they see some piece of someone else's work that shoots them back into working on something. And I've seen this several times in different classrooms where um, misbehavior actually gets alleviated because they're so engaged. And if there's a few that are off, I mean, we deal with that and it's not in front of the whole class anymore because it's actually quite a safe space. For me, anxiety is a huge one. Um, I work with a lot of adults who failed math in school miserably many times over and over again. And so here's a quote. This was the beginning of my realization that I was no longer alone in my mathematical struggles. So if there's a community backing them up and through random groups that are constantly changing, uh, they can find new confidants who they can connect with beyond the classroom as well. Perseverance has been incredible. Um, part of this, I think, has to do with uh, this, this sort of um, commitment to improving the greater understanding of the whole group. So being part of the, the group, it's no longer they're doing this for the teacher, they're doing this for their peers. And social barriers have been incredibly uh, shifted in my experience. I actually have students, um, about over half my class comes um, every year uh, as an international group. And so essentially they arrive in Canada and go to this class. And you can imagine that the social barriers are strong. And in some cultures between males and females, they segregate very naturally. And so what I've found personally, and it's been really magical to see um, South Asian females walking up to white males and just having a normal conversation as if nothing social was preventing them to do so because they've had this safe space in the classroom. And so I found that to be a really good reason to keep pursuing this. I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, okay, there's, there's there have to be challenges and there are always challenges. So one thing that comes to mind with that is challenges are always found where you are growing. And so for me, initially, it used to be a challenge um, to get buy-in from students. But as soon as I became really confident in what I did and I changed my assessments to kind of like value the thinking that happens and value the collaboration, that went away. Um, another challenge that I find is always uh, finding the right activity, the right task, and that comes with practice and time and every class, every time I teach the same topic, I end up teaching it slightly differently. But I found it very helpful to think about what the hints and extensions are going to be for that. So those are just some of the things I'm playing with um, personally, but I'm sure there are things that you also wonder about. Yes, Will, good question. Um, I mean, that that's a big one. I'll have to get back to you on that. <laughs> but before I get there, and tell you a little bit more about that. I do want to share a little bit of work that um, Maria, yeah, it does sound like another session. It's it's actually, uh, Anne Arden um, did a really cool talk at, at um, OAME recently, and she did a whole hour um, on assessment. So you might want to tap into that. So here's some research that was recently published. One of Peter's students and my colleague, Maria Kirkhoff, uh, she actually, in 18 days, covered all but two of her outcomes, which is very interesting. And, and I say covered with pause because covered in the sense that students encountered the material. It doesn't mean that they mastered the material, but 
if you think of a lecture covering content, of this is what students encountered in her class by essentially problem solving every day, 18 problems, 18 days. Really interesting results. Here are some, some quotes that I've pulled out. My ideas were listened to because I was given the marker. So another thing is giving every group of three students having one marker changes the game a little bit because you no longer have this sort of individual um, individual breakout where students try to do things by themselves. Um, they actually have to communicate because they have to share the marker. So also you can see a lot when you're the teacher and you're looking at the whiteboards. As Jimmy mentioned earlier in the chat pane, you actually can see a lot happening um, as it's getting on the placed on the board. Um, and so you can actually listen to where your students are at. Biggest thing for me is becoming invisible. And I've learned that when I become invisible, the student's learning becomes visible. And that's been huge for me. So since this session is about how it looks and feels like, when I can have this feeling of feeling invisible, I know it's like doing well. So the last point I wanna make um, before I open it up to some questions is that there are a lot of parts to this thinking classrooms research framework um, and it's rooted in a lot of um, educational theories and theories in math education but Peter's actually done a really nice job of organizing it into four parts and he recommends that teachers try implementation of one of these parts per year so what that means is trying out a few things from the top of this trying out good tasks, visibly random groups, vertical non-permanent surfaces, that's going to get you a lot of bang for your buck. Um, as you progress, trying some, adding some more of these in um, becomes, you start feeling the differences when you start doing that. So culture, it's definitely built a culture that produces things like this and somewhat, sometimes they're unreadable. Um, but I would encourage you highly to uh, connect to, if you want to learn more about this, connect with other people. Here are some examples of people I've connected with a lot, but if you look at the Thinking Classroom hashtag and scroll to photos or videos, there are a lot of people sharing things um, and everyone's very giving and welcoming. So I would encourage you to ask more questions online. Uh, Sorry, I'm <laughs> so uh, before I before I end here, thank you very much. I've got um, some links here. And if you follow this link, um, thinking class handout, it's got a whole bunch of resources and links of the things that I included in this presentation, as well as, um, as some resources and tips. There's also this other link TC community sign up if you could um, add your handle. And I'll create um, a Twitter uh, group. Sorry, it's not a group, it's something else. Yeah, so I'll create a Twitter group um, of people so that uh, you can all kind of connect with each other. And I would love to keep talking here. Um, I'm totally game for questions, uh, so we'll leave it at that. I, I may have missed some of your questions. I have, it's been hard to look at the chat pane and talk at the same time, to be honest. But thank you very much. And I encourage some questions. Um, thank you very much for presenting tonight, Judy. Um, oh, there's, a, there's a lot to think about. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, for sure. And uh, I think I, I just typed the, the bit.ly in the... Um, oh, thank you. Well, I typed it wrong, so I'm missing it. Oh. Well, there's okay. a T and a C community. So um, yeah, make sure you just type it as it is in here. Um, so here's the <laughs> handout. That's the handout right there. Yep. And then the other bit.ly, I, I tried to type in the chat window and I typed it wrong. I forgot. And the sign that. up is right there here. Go. Yep. Um, all right, well, thank you very much. Um, 
the recording is going to be available about in about 24 hours. And those of you that attended will have a, an email sent to you with a link to that. Um, and please feel free to share uh, this webinar with other teachers that you know. Um, before Judy uh, answers any other questions people might have, um, I just wanted to uh, let people know what the session is for uh, next week. Uh, the title of the session is Formative Assessment, brought to you by the number five. Um, and the session description has to do with um, the formative five and the five of the NCTM's effective mathematical teaching practices. And that session is being led by John Ray. So hopefully some of you will be able to join us next week for that session. Um, I am going to turn the recording off now, but you're welcome to stick around and ask Judy any questions that you might have. Thank you once again, Judy. Wonderful. Yeah, thanks very much.